Dr. Wendy Latouche, a member of the Yavapai Apache, Hopi, and Crow Nations, has been teaching bassoon at the University of Wyoming in Laramie since 2006. She has previously taught world music and American music in the Department of Ethnomusicology at Fresno State University, California, as, where, as well as American Indian music at the University of Colorado at Boulder. She received her doctorate in musical arts degree with an emphasis on American Indian music from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dr. Latouche is also an active orchestral performer. Over the past five years, she has played with the Boulder Philharmonic Orchestra, Fresno Philharmonic Orchestra, Reno Chamber Orchestra, and the Greeley Philharmonic Orchestra, as well as the Colorado Music Festival. Um, tonight is a very special night. Wendy Latouche, as, in addition to being a, a great ethnomusicologist specializing in American Indian music, is a member of, uh, of several tribes. And so therefore, she has permission to actually play some uh, musical examples that one would never be able to hear. Uh, many of these examples are part of the sacred tradition of the American Indians, and so therefore outsiders aren't uh, allowed really to play this uh, music. Uh, but Wendy, being a member of the tribes, is able to play this. So uh, in Beirut of all places, we get to hear this incredible, uh, this incredible resource. So I present to you Dr. Wendy Latouche. Um, 
an outsider's of, of view. So whenever you go into another culture, study another culture, um, you have the Enoch um, point of view and also the Enoch point of view, which is the insider's view. So when I talk about my music, um, indie music from the Southwest or the Plain region, for me, um, at Esme College, we call it the Enoch type of view. Um, Something else that we commonly use with the study of music, uh, practical, meaning um, listening to music, lis um, and then the discourse, which is talking and writing about music. And, um, and also, <coughs> two more words I want to, I'll be using a lot um, the next hour, is called pan-tribal. And is that word used here? I'm just wondering, has anyone heard of the term pan-tribal? That's a term that we use in North America, meaning all tribes. It's something that's kind of come up with in the last 100, 150 years when uh, music with uh, what's happened you know, in North America is with American Indians. Uh, we've all come together, we've come together with powwows. Um, powwows is something that's new, it's only been going on for about you know, 80, 80 years, kind of the tradition of powwow, we're going to put you in today. Um, so we have a lot of pan-tribal, inter-tribal. It's the kind of thing where it's for all, um, all groups to participate in. And you will have um, within this music cultural simil um, similarities of whoever's singing that music, whoever's dancing, they'll be dressed in regalia, sing in their own regional style. But this is something we're um, called pan-tribal, where everyone can participate, participate together. And also, um, have you heard of the terminology vocables? Anyone heard of vocables? Okay, these are what we call words with no meaning. And <laughs> we use it a lot um, when you listen, to, I'll be playing a lot of music here for you guys. Um, a lot with uh, words with no meaning like hey, nay, yo, way, yo, yay, hey, yay. And there are still different ways depending on which different regions that you are coming from. Um, so if I was to sing a song, uh, Dago Te, which means it's like a uh, Dago Te is like saying hello, it's a health song. Um, I'm asking how you're doing. That's an uh, Apache. So if I, you know, um, see you walking down the street, I haven't seen you in a while. I want to see how you're doing. So I'd sing you a song to read you. So I'd be like Dago Te, Dago Te. Those last words I'm using are vocables. They don't mean anything. But they're just words that we use pan-tribally um, to use. So you'll be listening when I um, play you some music examples. Um, please listen for these. Um, the first region I want to talk about is the Southwest region. You can look at your map right here. Down in the Southwest part of the Americas, <laughs> in North America. Um, and I do have another one, um, another page of this kind of enlarged here. You have the Indian Reservation Southwest in 1944. So give you an idea of the area that we're talking about. Um, Arizona, um, New Mexico, these states, southern, um, southwest Colorado, parts southeast of Utah. Um, we do part of the cultural back um, before, you know, several hundred years ago, there wasn't a borderline <coughs> in Mexico. So we did have a lot of language, cultural groups, you know, that are in Mexico. Um, we do have a lot of some of the southern tribes that are now living in Mexico. They're actually now Mexican um, citizens rather than American citizens. It just became about where, you know, when Mexico came in state, you know, which side were the Indians on? And now you can be Papago from Mexico, Papago Indian from Arizona. Um, it also goes down to southwest, um, I mean the western side of Texas. So, um, and this, if you want to go, I know this map's harder. This gives you an idea of what's left today um, of the reservations on in the America, what's left of land. So it's been a huge from the last 400 years when this should be completely shaded on to just little bits of spots of land that's left today. So it gives you an idea of what's, um, um, how things have been. <laughs> so with the Southwest, um, I want to talk about this region. It's a very dry and arid region. Um, and 
Um, this pool of plateaus. We do have river basins. If you want to look at your map of New Mexico, lots of rivers. And you see you have all of the pueblos um, actually originated by uh, the rivers because they were um, dwellers. They have um, adobe style homes. You can see this is actually a picture of Taos Pueblo. And you have adobe style homes. And this is still, this is a today's picture. It's still happening today. Um, you can go and visit this area. Um, visitors have to park outside, only residences park inside. You still have about 300 um, Taos Pueblo members actually still living here today. They have voted not to um, have running water, and they do have some electricity, but they um, actually voted not to, not to have this because they want to live in a traditional way. Um, and we do have a lot of different um, um, pueblos, about 19 pueblos still in existence today that are still living <coughs> like this. Um, so that's kind of nice to see. Um, the pueblos, culturally, um, they were farmers. The main uh, staple crop was corn, um, squash, um, and they have been in beans, and they have been in this early, in this area of the Southwest um, as far back as like 300 BC. So that's how old some of these uh, dwellings are. And if you want to, can you go to the Hopi one? This is, uh, I know this picture is really hard. Um, this is Second Mesa Hopi. This is actually where one of my tribes is. And see how it's built up on the plateau um, over here on the side. It's built up. And this is actually the, one of the oldest in the Americas of continual um, living areas. It still goes on. And it still lives in traditional um, areas. Um, you can come visit this. You're not allowed to take a uh, pencil, paper, um, no um, photographs. You can't um, take any pictures. It's very traditional. You're required to park down below and hike up. Um, you're not invited. You're not allowed to come in during any ceremonial days at all. Only Hopi members, not even other tribal members, are allowed to come in and see any of the ceremonies. They're very strict uh, with who can come. And there's actually three mesas. This is the second one. And the people who can actually come up here are only members, and people do actually, there's a road, you can drive in there. But you, you walk up and you can you know, buy lots of artifacts, talk with people, see, um, you know, this is hundreds and hundreds of year, years old, see um, how people are still living today. Um, there is electricity up there, it's very limited. Um, there's no plumbing or anything, and they, again, they voted do we want to put this on? And they, the tribal camps, everyone voted no, we're going to leave it traditional um, and just keep, keep leaving. So there are, with the three ones, and there's one down below. And you can see how arid and dry and rocky. And this was actually very good for protection um, with rains, um, mainly from, you know, several hundred years ago before the Spanish, from the um, Apaches and the Navajos that would come. And they were, you know, part raiders, part. Um, you know, farmers, but they're like, oh, the pueblos are easy. They're very into farming, and they have lots of food, so let's you know, go raise them. <laughs> so, but this was really high up, um, for protection, and they did all of their farming, and they have irrigation down below. And again, the main staple uh, was corn here in this area. They're very into their corn, and uh, one of their main deities that they um, um, do a lot of ceremonies for is the sun, the sun god. Um, the Hopis actually, they're different. They have, um, have you guys heard of Kachina dolls? Yeah. yeah. Dolls, Kachinas. They actually have like over 200, I think they're like 270 different Kachina do dolls. So they had over 270 different types of main um, and ceremonies they do for, it's like having 270 different gods that you would, um, you know, give thanks to um, anything you did. And their music followed everything. So that's, um, so that's why I want you to learn so much about the culture, because music was everything. You greet someone with music, you go out and plant corn, you have music that follows it. You have the china doll, something that you want to um, give honor to, you have music. The music was, is still, is still anything you do, grinding corn, you have special corn made in music that you have to do. Um, so anyway, so that's, um, kind of the bubbles. Let me explain some songs here for you in a second. The other main group in the Southwest region are the Apaches. And has everyone heard about the Apaches? Yes, I've heard of them. 
Paget became very famous um, with Geronimo. Everyone's heard of Geronimo. Actually, he was Chiricahua Apache. He's coming from the southwestern part of Arizona. And I'm actually um, Yavapai Apache. You also have San Carlos Apache, um, uh, by Rigoso Mescalero Apache. And that's actually, they're the first ones to actually start the peyote ceremony. Um, and I have some peyote songs to play for you guys shortly. Um, so, I'm going to talk, we grouped the Apache and the Navajos. We call the Navajos, but traditionally they've gone back to the original name. The original name is called Diné, D-I-N-E. And now whenever you go on to the reservation, you see in their language, welcome to Diné Reservation. And then they put the Navajo in parentheses. Because Diné was their name in their language. So they're going back to that. Navajo was a name that you know, the white man's cellars gave to them. So a lot of these um, tribes are now going back to original tribal names. So, um, so Diné, the Apache and the Diné actually came in, um, in from this area from, um, they've also migrated in, um, all from the plains areas on over, up from the Northwest area on down. Um, the Diné is actually, their language group is closely tied to the Clinkets up in Alaska. And the, the Clinkets are said to have come through on the first wave of migration across the Bering Strait, across um, Siberia, Mongolia. And you have a wave about 15,000 years ago where they stayed and they have this language that's very um, uh, glutural. It's come from the back of the throat when they speak. And it's actually, they have the closest ties, the Clinkets actually, to the Navajo Diné people and their language. The Apaches are Athabascan speakers, and um, they've come from a different language group. But we kind of put them together because they're both living in the Southwest. Um, and they're, they're different from the, they had the shared similarities in how they moved about. Um, <coughs> and they were part-time, the Apache Navajo was part-time hunter-gatherers. And then they also did some farming on the side. Um, if you wanted to look at this, this one page right here, I have a different uh, poem. Um, because unfortunately, due to Hollywood um, and movies you've seen, they always portray, no matter what Indian group you're from or what they're talking about, we all apparently live in teepees. And that's not true. <laughs> um, and if you look up on the upper left hand side, you have the Navajo Saab or the Adobe Hogan. <clears throat> that's very similar to what they live in. And you do got a lot, they're called Hogans. And these are traditional mud homes. And you still see them all over the place in Arizona, uh, mainly. Um, and these are the homes uh, they, they lived in. And they're very warm, they're just one big room, circular, they're very, with the fire in the middle and um, now a big, you know, big stove and um, very, very cool in the, in the summer, you know, this is Arizona, it gets very hot and very warm in the winter. So these are the Hogan's that they live in, it's traditional homes. So these you see all over Arizona. Um, the Apaches lived in something more like, um, kind of like you have this great basin in the middle these little huts. These are kind of a, a tr very similar to, um, to the Great Basin. The Apaches lived in something um, very similar um, to this. These are like hugget. We use these from um, branches of acotillos. These are a certain type of plant that are only grown in the Southwest. So we had homes and you'd cover them with uh, deer skin and then um, we'd go in there and you know, sleep, I mean, you know, being so warm and sunny and rain with it that common in the southwest so you did a lot of your cooking and everything you spent so much time outside so these are the two types of homes that you see along with the pueblos um, that you see in this cultural area um, the first um, so with the Apaches and the Navajo which came into this area around 12 1300 um, AD. So they came in a lot later, almost a thousand years later, after the Pueblos have already been in this area. Um, it's hard to date um, um, anything with uh, American Indian history so much because 
the fact that there was there is no written language. We had been did, did not write anything out. There was no alphabet. There was no writing. Everything we have comes through um, the dating is through pottery. They're able to date pottery. Also, um, stories and culture and how things go um, with the keep the tribe going all come from stories and music. There's, you know, you have stories in the songs, you keep teaching the language, keep teaching music, that gets passed generation by generation. So we're very much into telling the story. When you go on to um, a reservation and you say, oh, I promise to do, you have my word, you have the word of that person. That means everything, you know, because if they break their word, you know, a lot of honor is broken. Um, so there is no, um, written language. Now there is. In the past about, you know, 80, 100 years, a lot of people have come in, recorded the language, tried to fit it to the sounds to uh, English and try and transcribe it like that to keep it preserved. Um, but it, it's hard to really date the history of a lot of this stuff and when actually events did happen because we're going off of paintings, of artifacts you see of um, <coughs> colors that are painted on um, your skin as well, pillow hide. That's we're going off of uh, pictures and symbols, unfortunately. So, um, talking about this, uh, the whole area, the Spanish were one of the first ones to come in um, to contact in this area around 16, um, 1600 was the first contact with Spanish explorers. And they were forced um, to, uh, the first time any of um, you've seen, Horses for the first time, you know, metal armor, that was, you know, something, whoa. And so it was pretty easy for the Spanish to come in and take over the area. And they insisted on reverting everyone to Catholicism. And so you see in almost all of these pueblos in this area, they have a lot of Catholic churches, a lot of missionary churches, you know, we call them. And, um, but in the 1680s, there was a big, uh, uh, all of the um, pueblos came together and there was a big revolt. So after that big revolt, they, you know, things were um, not so harsh on the pueblos and they were able to do a lot of their secret um, song and ceremonies and um, in private, and as long as they still you know, went to church and practiced Catholicism on the side. So it was kind of a thing um, back. Um, one of our first, um, since the invention of the phonograph, um, by Thomas Edison. We actually do have um, our recordings, which actually go back to our first recordings when we started recording music back in 1889. And the first recording of American Indian music was actually done at Zuni Pueblo. <coughs> so this was this area was first recorded. So we do have a lot of wax cylinders. And um, Unfortunately, a lot of the wax cylinders um, that have been recorded, thousands and thousands of songs, are actually at Indiana University in Indiana. And the next largest um, um, compile is in uh, Berlin. The Germans have really liked American Indians, so they, they have like one of their biggest collections of American Indian music is actually in Berlin. And we're trying to get some of that back <laughs> so we can you know, use it and study it. So, um, um, first I'm going to be playing, I'm going to play you a song by the San Juan Pueblo. Um, you're going to be hearing in this song um, a rattle. Um, rattle is uh, used as a rhythmic ornamentation um, for rhythm. Um, the voice you hear is either all going to be uh, male voices and it's, uh, what they do is they line up in a line. And it's kind of like a line dancing. They're all in the same costume, the same line. And when they want you to really listen to, they do everything in unison here. And also, uh, what's very common about this Pueblo music is what we have, well, we only see it here, is called the ta'a. And it is T-A comma A. And this is, um, what it is, is just a displacement of rhythm. And they're actually dance to this. And this is the only time we actually ever see that is in a dancing with the the Pueblo Indians. Only type of song here. So let me see if I can get this going. So well, the piece I'm playing for you now is called the Tewa Cloud Dance Song. And this is from Tewa Pueblo in, this, in New Mexico. Thank you. 
the Patsies are a lot different with their music. They have, um, I guess it's a very open style, very um, kind of similar to the song, very open, relaxed style of voice. Um, things don't usually go more than an octave um, when, they, when you sing. Um, but really common about music is you have, um, usually with vocal bowls, you have some kind of melodic entry. Um, you have a song, entry song, and then the second part of it is called a chant. You get a lot of chanting, and that will be in the native language. And that's where we always have like a two part. One part is actually the melody, and the second part is a chant. Um, so we use vocal bowls in the first part. The second part is chanting in the native language. And it's, it's not, there's no melody. You're just talking fluently, chanting. You're saying your message that you need to do for that song, whatever the song is supposed to be for. And then you'll go back to the melody. Uh, what's interesting about the Apaches is the type of drum that uh, is commonly used. What they use is a kettle drum. It's about this big. It's just a kettle bucket. And you fill it full of water. They use a water drum. And then you have a lid on top. And this is, you wet it and put, um, put your uh, deer skin on top or any kind of hide. Um, normally it's deer skin. You put it on top and you wrap it around. And what they use for a drumstick is a yucca. Has anyone seen these before? A yucca? It's like New Mexico snake flower. They live, they're like this big. Um, they kind of look like ivory down the bottom, kind of spiny, um, spiny uh, flower heads kind of popping out. And they're long. Um, stalks that come straight up and they'll bloom with flowers. Well, they take part of this bark and they wet it. And what they do is they wrap it around in a circle. So it's straight across and it kind of goes around in a circle, kind of like the number nine. Um, and then they wrap it up with a sinew. Um, and which is sinew is actually a part of a, any part of a, like a stomach or something you used to tie to sew with of an animal. So they wrap it up and then you just hit it with the head of that on this water drum. Um, so I'm going to play this uh, this Apache Mescalero song for you, and I want you to listen first to the melody. It's kind of a very simple melody. It doesn't go up more than I think a third or a fourth in pitch, and then you're going to have a chant. But the drum that's used on this is actually using that um, yucca stick drum on the, uh, the water on the deer skin on the kettle. Legalized. You can actually 
uh, American Indians can actually do a peyote ceremony and actually get off from work for doing the ceremony. It's actually, uh, we, can, we can do this. As long as it's, when it, it's in a controlled uh, environment. Um, it's a very strong hallucinogenic. Uh, basically, they take this cactus and dry it. Dry it up, and it's like green, flaky, and it's very bitter tasting. And why I have included this in the Southwest, they actually, the idea of the peyote that came out in about the 1850s um, with, it was something that they're trying to do to create uh, traditional Indian music and style along with um, Christianity. This is something they're trying to do. And this actually, the idea comes about with a medicine man, the Paiute medicine man in the Great Basin. And the actual drug and actually some of the first tribes to actually do this were the Mescalero Apaches. Um, nowadays, it's, it's very common among the Navajo, the Dene, to do this. So when you're going along the, the um, Arizona Navajo Reservation, and you see all these adobe, you know, traditional hogans, all of a sudden you see a teepee. You're like, well, wait a minute. And this is what we call uh, the teepee ceremony, is another name for it, because it's a peyote, it's a ceremony that starts at around 10 o'clock at night. You have a master of ceremonies in there. Um, you have a fire keeper, somebody's at the door, and a fire keeper. And you go in there, these are from two or three sessions. You start around 10 p.m. and you have about two or three water breaks. And then you finish up at around six o'clock in the morning. And then at sunrise, you have a big feast with everyone who's involved. In the ceremony, um, this is one of our very, one of our most religious ceremonies. So a lot of people just won't bring anyone in. Like sometimes people, you have to be in here to do these ceremonies. Um, that's when you start using the peyote. You're allowed to, it's a drug, again, like it's this plant, you put it in your mouth and then you eat it and swallow it. And it is very hallucinogenic. It's a very, very strong drug. <laughs> and um, I, I've done the peyote ceremony before. And um, it's amazing that you think you're in there for you know eight hours, but it really goes by about in about five minutes. <laughs> I mean, it, it's quite incredible. And you, you're like, oh, we are, we're done. Um, so what you do in, in the ceremony, I'm not going to go into detail because this is a sacred ceremony. But um, with the peyote um, music, you have a peyote, a special peyote drum. And this is a clay pot. It's about this big of a clay pot. Um, and it's, again, it's filled with water. We fill this with water. And you use a skin, a uh, type of deer hide, very common, to go over the top. Um, and then you have eight rocks that you put on the ground, the, um, the clay pot. And this you use um, string to hold, rope to hold down the, um, the skin on top. And in order to play this, you have to keep the skin wet. So um, in this ceremony, you have um, only peyote songs are played in the ceremony, and you have a drumstick. So you have someone playing the drum, for, and then you have someone else singing. Um, you have to, when you sing, you can, you can pass the drum along. It, the drum gets passed person to person. You can drum for someone. It's a real honor if someone wants to drum for you, whoever is sitting next to you. And if you don't know any song, you just you know pass the drum to the next person, and they do it. And then usually, um, when someone starts singing a peyote song, if the, uh, the rest of the group knows it, they will also sing it and also sing the same song too. Um, but you have to sing it at least four times. Um, anyone know why? I have an idea why we do things by fours. Right. Yes. We give thanks for every direction. When we pray, anything you do, you give thanks to always for four directions, for the north, the south, the east, and the west. We also have four sacred colors, uh, the black, white, um, red, and yellow. You see these a lot of colors, um, on a lot of outfits and regalias, and I'll be showing you pictures and, um, shortly when we get to playing stuff. So um, that's why we always do these songs by at least four times through. So this, this recording is kind of hard to hear. Um, the pace is really fast. It's like bup, 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 bup. I want you to listen to the um, drum. 
and then it'll take about a minute to go through the first verse. And in between verses, what the drummer has to do is dip <coughs> the drum. You got to keep that skin wet. So you're playing blah 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 blah, blah. and then the singing will stop, and you go. Blah, 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 blah. You hear the dipping of the drum. Blah, 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 and that's what's going on in this in this purity song I'm playing. Humor um, songs, lyrics uh, about humor, 
about being dumped by a woman, about drunken behavior, is very common in songs. And uh, this one last year at Taos, we had a good time with each other. We so they went to a dance together, went to a powwow. Now we're back at Taos, you don't know me, honey, yes, it's over. Um, it's what, <laughs> this song is also done in unison, and the beat of it here is a little bit different. You have a, a duple like bum, 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 rhythm. So I want to go ahead and play this one last year out of Taos. Oh, <laughs> 
um, of music also comes from um, the, the, the music that we have. Um, one, the, the Northern is, we call them Northern, and they have a really, really high range. Um, the range is usually like an octave to an octave and a half, um, and which is kind of ironic because you have these big men. If you remember uh, seeing a lot of these Indians, and American Indians, up in the Northern part are, are tall. Having six, six, two, six, four tall men is very common. And then, uh, and then you have like these Pueblo Indians, which are small, and, and shorter. I mean, it's kind of amazing. The more south you go, the shorter the people are. And you can see it in the brewings and stuff like that. You know, we have doorways like this, and then all of a sudden you have these big, massive Indians out on the plains. You know, they're just huge. But yet they sing so high. Um, these type of falsetto and throat, they sing very high, huge high. Um, what's very common in this area is a terrace descending line. Does anyone know what this means? Terrace descending lines. Terrace. Means it goes across, you sing a pitch, and all of a sudden it'll drop down. Sing another pitch, drop down, drop down, down. At the end of the melody, you go back to the top. And so, melody, way back up here. Um, but, and the same thing with the southern. It's just, again, the southern is a lot lower. And then one reason why the southern singing is a lot lower because um, the women sing. Um, they sing with the men sitting around the drum, and um, they sing usually an octave higher. So in order to sing an octave higher, the men have to start a little bit lower. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have too much time. I'm just going to be showing you, I want to show you some photographs um, of some different types. Um, <coughs> here, is this the black one? Yes. I wanted to give you some ideas if, if you were to ever to go to a powwow. Um, powwow is something, it's pan-tribal. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> powwow is something that came about in the turn of the century because, you know, Americans were forbidden to, you know, they took kids and put them in, you know, Christian school. You're forbidden to, you know, sing your songs. You're forbidden to speak your language. Um, and you're forbidden to do ceremonies. So at the turn of the century, um, a lot of you know these tribes that used to fight against each other just said we need to band together. So that's where we get the pan tribal from, and also um, also where we have the beginning of our powwows that will still go on quite strong today. And like I said, we have a huge circuit that goes on. There's always powwows. Like you know, I live in Denver, Colorado, and there's always a powwow going on every weekend. Always, some of them are small and some of them are big, big, huge ones. And fortunately, we have one of the largest powwows in the world, actually in Denver, the third week of uh, March. Um, this is the northern outfit. Um, the colors that you see, um, people are now getting brighter and brighter colors because they're out there dancing, they want to show off. Um, this isn't something you would wear out in an everyday thing. This is only if you're dressing up um, for a, a dance, a ceremony. So this is what you would wear. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's part of the the is that part of the thing? It could just be something that you put it on. <laughs> it's actually me. You see a lot of contemporary stuff. <laughs> so again, he's here to draw to carry feathers. Um, the the fringe is a symbol. Is a is a usually a symbol for rain, is something that goes, uh, goes way back to the whole piece used. But uh, fringe is really common, and like I wish I had a picture of a woman's dress, because um, in the South, uh, like in Oklahoma, the Southern, they have really, really long fringes. They'll have their arms, their arms will go up, and they'll be all the way down to the ground. And that's how you know, ah, they're a Southerner. And then as Northerners, we have little small ones. You know. And that's a, kind of more the traditional way. Um, these, right here, and you see that blue in there, the blue. Uh, you have a lot of tribal colors, tribal pictures that are kind of common that you use that represents your own tribe. So you might have all these other for fluorescent colors or something, but you have a family color and you also have certain tribal colors. So I don't, I think this is black, but so this comes up in like the Montana, the, the Canadian border area, but um, 
and he has a feather, his long feather, like crows, we don't use that, we have fossil feather, but not, the men don't have it, but very long. So they're, they're, everyone does it a little different. Painting is just however they want to do it, there's no really, they, it's significant to him, what, what he wants to do. Um, you want to do this picture? Uh, is he holding that drumstick? Is that, is that no, that's usually uh, um, uh, no. See how he has in there is a, a dream catcher. Oh, that right yeah. here. Have you guys have seen these dream catcher that they mean to put on your bedside to catch bad dreams, so you always have good dreams. It's just um, these are sticks that they use. Um, sometimes these were um, you see people used to dance with tomahawks, axes. Sometimes they have sticks with the, their color. Sometimes they have, um, it depends on what kind of dance, I mean, he's a traditional dance, but it depends on what he's trying to evoke. A lot of times we have a thing called uh, counting coup. And what this means, there was actually a famous uh, Sioux uh, chief called counting coups. No, he's crow, counting coups. Which means you can go, go out, and if you're able to touch, you know, with a stick, your enemy, and get away, and make him know that you touched him, you got away, and, but you didn't kill them, so now they have to live with, like, they, you know, <laughs> you know, oh, my enemy got me, but I'm still alive. Well, what, what honor is that? You know, there was no cattle. So you have this one uh, pro chief, he was really famous. He had, like, 40-some-odd counting coops. That's what they call it. And so sometimes they have these sticks, and when they dance, tradition, they'll go on, and they'll pretend, you know, they'll be dancing, pretend they're hitting the ground, like they're hitting something, like, oh, they're counting coops, you know, or something, that's what they call it. And it's just everyone carries different things. Sometimes they have handbags, purses, drums, feathers. I'm um, going with this picture, headdress. Um, in a powwow, unfortunately I don't have time to go too in depth, we have certain, uh, certain different types of dancing wear. Um, this is actually, and we have music that goes along with it. This is called uh, a fancy dance. <laughs> and this came about um, colors. Um, you see they have feathers on their backs and on their bustles, um, they had some kind of skin, skin and then their shoes. Again, the moccasins will be in that, the, the design of that particular tribe where they belong from. And so you can, that's how you, people would try to be able to recognize someone out on the plains. You know, you come across, you can tell the way, the type of saddle they're using, the, the way the horse is painted, um, the colors, just the, the beadwork, the artwork, you, said, you can tell what tribe you come from. Um, this came about, this, they used to have really fast beatings uh, with the drum being boom, 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 really fast, paddle drumming. And he said he's just holding a stick. And um, these are just for show. So they are, they're just going around in circles. They go down, do squats up. Sometimes you see them move splits, and they're going back up, and legs. I mean, it's quite amazing. So you have some people, and everyone picks whoever they want to be. It's not like one day I'm going to be a traditional dance, the next day I'm going to how be a fancy. He's a fancy dancer for his life. That's what he is. Um, do you want to go to the one? This is an outfit of a grass dancer. And the grass dancer is really common to the plains area. Because back before all white men came with the, the cows, you know, we had buffalo, we had sweet grass that was pretty much this high. And you had, you know, grass from here to here. So, you come across, okay, I want to build my camp here, but what do you do when the grass is this thick and you want to put your teepee down on it? So he's like, honey, go put on your, you know, we'll get to get grass dancers. So what they do, they sit down, bring out the big drum. All the grass dancers uh, get dressed. And originally, these would be grass, the big grass in this field. And these are dancers that come down, play music, and they come out and stomp down the grass. And they're like, okay, now you can put up your teepee. You know, so they stomped it all down. And so these are what they call grass dancers. And now they, they just use fringe. And so they actually have, when you have a contest powwow, then you'll say, okay, next group can have out all the men's grass dancers, you know, teenage, and then they'll have the adults. They have different categories. So that's what that outfit is. Anyone want to go to the next one? Again, these are just of the powwow. I just want to give you ideas. Here's a guy who's dancing and doing the head dip. Um, again, this is a very traditional, common uh, pan tribal symbol right here. Talking about the four sacred colors, you know, um, the black and white, and the red and the yellow, and everything usually in four. Um, you see that a lot. And again, it's 
He has a big fossil, um, eagle feathers. Um, in America, eagles are illegal this, um, to own, but American Indians are allowed to have them. And so if you ever have um, traveled with eagle, um, eagle feathers, you always have to have your tribal ID with you. And you have to show that, and then you're allowed to have the eagle feathers. And in order to get these, a lot of people go onto a registry. So if they find, um, you just go onto a list, so if they find a, a bird that's been killed, you know, on the highway or, or you know, been killed or something, they will take the feathers and they'll call the next person on the list and say, I have an eagle, do you want it? And then you can um, make outfits out from it. Um, and then these are usually just passed down generation through generation. So these are another men's traditional, and see another guy coming back, see how he has different types of beadwork. Here he has, I think this is a, like a north, uh, more of an eastern coast, because you have the sign of the turtle. Um, and those are more Eastern Indians um, signatures. And then you have another guy right here, again, more with the colors from where he's from. This, remember when I showed you the, a picture of that fancy dancer boy, that man fancy dancer? This is what we call a fancy woman's dancer. Uh, when we dance in the powwow, all women will go out and wear a shawl, shawl with fringes. So if I'm just gonna go to the powwow, and if I just feel like dancing, um, I, I will bring, I have a couple of shawls I'll bring and I'll just wear. And I just, you know, wear your jeans, whatever, you just put it over. If you're gonna go out there, it's pretty customary, um, you wear it. But here, these are shawls, they're beaded, extraordinary. Again, all the yellow and the flowers, those are beaded, little bead works done. But all this is just sewn, colors, colors. These are traditional moccasins from her tribe where she comes from. And um, it's a special dance that's come about, again, with the evolution of the powwow. And um, so it, they do contests for this. I wanted to show you a picture of what the different outfits are. So when you go to the you see all these different outfits. Their purpose is for, they're different categories. It's, just, it's not just all the one. Uh, sorry, so each tribe is kind of ID by their shoes or their moccasins? The, by the artwork on them. Oh. One by colors and one by the artwork that you see. Oh. And again, I wish I could have brought some more stuff to show you, like here's a belt of mine, you know, from my tribe, and it, it's, you know, similar colors and patterns. Can yeah. anyone be a fancy dancer? Or do yeah, you yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just, you know, you, you just know that you want to dance and be a part of This is amazing, the dancing. You just know, like when you grow up, I mean, you decide when you're younger what you want to be. I mean, my father was my brother who like, you're traditional, you'll be a male traditional. You know, you're gonna be a woman's traditional, you know, because he did, he's very traditional. He didn't want to go off, oh, this is, came about a you know, hundred years ago. That's not traditional. He's, you know, he wanted something more, you're traditional, you white skin, none of this. But um, a lot of people just want to do this. I mean, again, we have jingle dresses. Jingle dresses is actually a cake old uh, tobacco tin can, you know, a tobacco can. And you take the, the lids or the bottoms off of them, they're circular round, you roll them up and they put them on their dresses. They make a <coughs> noise. So it's, and now it's become a dance, a jingle dress dancing. Do I have any more? Those are all the dancers. Okay. So anyway, I wanted to play you some songs um, that uh, come from, this, uh, from the Plains area, the northern and the southern. And then um, Mr. Kim, Dr. Kim is gonna show how to dance some of this stuff. <laughs> Anyway, the first one is a northern, and this is a, a, an intertribal. So I want you to listen, listen to the terrace descending lines, and again, we're going to start high and go low. Yeah. <laughs> 
go like that. It's not a, a super fast pace, it's a nice dance pace. Because again, I mean, when you're power on, you're doing it all night long, so you don't want to go too fast. The next song um, I'm going to play for you is, um, <coughs> is a Kiowa. It's a war dance song, and the Kiowas come from um, the Oklahoma region area. And this is a, a southern song, so when you hear the difference of the voices, and also you're going to hear the women's voice singing in the background. Song. 
and um, it's by the Clinkets, uh, it's spelled Clinket, T-L-I-N-G-I-T, and this is a big uh, tribe area up, up in this area, um, mainly southeastern Alaska, and the Clinket tribes, oh yeah, here we go. Here you have is a traditional Thinket man. Um, they're really into the whales, the bears, ravens, frogs. Um, remember when you've seen uh, pictures of totem poles? Mm -hmm. The big uh, wood carving. This is the area that it comes from. Um, they're very well known for that. Um, you can see on this, uh, his, his buckskin here, um, he has the whale up there. Um, the raven, very common. Um, <coughs> This is a, a traditional Clinket man here in uh, Haynes, Alaska. On the top part of his outfit, can you see those are mirrored um, uh, eagles? See the faces of the birds? Eagles and ravens. And they believe that they're very into the deity of the raven. They believe that the raven is the one that created them and the world. Um, so a lot of songs are about the raven. So anyway, I want to play in the song. Uh, also with the Klinka people, they had huge boats, um, transportation to get in, a lot like the Polynesians. Big, big trees, big boats. They can get, you know, 60, 80 people in, everyone paddling. I mean, they can go to Hawaii, come back in four days, um, like four days to get over the following tide. They'd also come down to like the, the coast of California and trade, do a lot of trading, and then go back up. So. Um, this is called a paddling song. There's music that they use to keep it seen to paddle. And again, it's very uh, portable. You'll, you'll like this. <coughs> Into one, into one slot. 
So we create our own with the division of kind of more that traditional north south, some contemporary with um, contemporary instruments. Anyway, this is a group of female singers uh, who go back to the traditional way of singing. And this is a very um, into the style of call and response um, from um, the southeast coast of the North Carolina.
So basically, you're going to use the lump for the front end or do a nice block. And then you can go a little more in depth. Yes, on the knee. Very good. And then remember when I showed you pictures of count, like a male counting hoops? Yeah. And women, what they do, you would dance if you're a fancy dance, Thank <laughs> you. 